Love, Hate, and Propaganda, a six-part series with George Strombolopoulos, 70 years later, why World War II still matters. What would you do if you saw something terrible? You got it on camera, and you want to show the world. But here's the thing, you're not allowed to. So what do you do? In the case of a Japanese police photographer in World War II, he knew he had pictures of something that would shock the world. Then he realized he was gonna have to hide them. Tonight is all about hiding the horrors in World War II, how inconvenient truths were swept under the carpet, and not just in Japan, but in Germany, in France, Canada too. It all happened in a time of love, hate, and propaganda. June 6th, 1944, D-Day. The largest invasion by water in history, nearly 150,000 Allied troops in all. British, Americans, Canadians are all set to invade Normandy on the western shore of France. For years, Hitler had controlled most of Europe, but the tide of war was finally turning. In the east, the Soviets under Stalin were advancing towards Berlin. In the south, the Allies had landed in Italy, but they badly needed to open up the Western Front and drive the Nazis out of Europe. They also needed a major propaganda victory to show that they were finally beating back the Germans. So, they covered the D-Day invasion with what was called the greatest pictorial team play in history. More than 500 reporters, photographers, and cameramen, many of them Canadian, ready to record this moment in history. Imagine what it looked like through the eye of the lens. The cameraman had a job to do, even as their friends fell around them and they captured some of the most famous battle sequences ever. And it was Canadians who scooped everyone. These were the first and best pictures of D-Day, images that would thrill audiences in cinemas around the world. More than 60 years later, here we are. We're still talking about it. We're still watching this footage. No history book is going to be as powerful as the film footage, as watching our Canadian soldiers going into battle through the eyes of somebody who was there. It's amazing. These men were called camera commandos. Members of the Canadian Army's film and photo unit. Soldiers shooting film, not bullets. A commanding hilltop made an excellent observation point from which to direct the fire, and also for Sergeant Cameraman Jimmy Campbell to do a little shooting on his own. He was working as a cameraman in Hollywood, but this was a story too big to miss for Jimmy Campbell. At 38, he was one of the team's oldest members, but he quickly earned a reputation for being a hard worker and a risk taker. Like all the cameramen, uh, Jimmy Campbell was very brave and he would do anything he could to get his shot. Uh, he would be right in the midst of battle, documenting things. Sometimes the cameras even got ahead of the action. In the confusion of one battle, Three camera commandos made it to the French town of Fleury sur Orne and ended up capturing more than film. They arrived in the city and, and only knew that they had arrived there ahead of everyone because German soldiers came out and surrendered to them. It was sheer chaos, but throughout it all, the film unit managed to hold on to a couple prisoners. 
What happened to Battleground Pictures afterwards was just as interesting. They were rushed back from the front, vetted by military censors, then cut and recut, reassembled into newsreels seen by millions in movie theaters across Canada. Canadian armor moved with the British toward Bayeux and Caen. It was all under the watchful eye of this man, John Grierson, the creator and head of Canada's National Film Board. A driven man, not fond of sleeping or eating, he had been a preacher and a teacher, but now he was both. He became, arguably, the greatest propagandist of the war on the Allied side. In war as in peace, the wisest propaganda keeps men rich in hope. Grierson had this view of propaganda that may surprise people today, because most of us think of propaganda as manipulative, negative, lies. But Grierson saw propaganda as a weapon of truth that could educate, inspire, unite. Instead of propaganda being less necessary in a democracy, it is more necessary. In the authoritarian state, you have powers of compulsion and powers of repression. Not so in a democracy. Grierson reveled in the fact that he was deemed to be a propaganda maestro. And this was something of which he was not ashamed because a propagandist was not someone who was inherently evil. And why not learn from the man who had mastered the art of manipulation? Grierson studied the tactics and technique of Joseph Goebbels, Hitler's minister of propaganda. The Nazis had harnessed the power of film. And Grierson believed the Allies had to be just as aggressive in selling their side of the war. So he built up an army of 800 staff, churning out over 500 films in six years. Grierson wanted to beat Goebbels at his own game. Film is one of the great new instruments of war propaganda. It can make people love each other or hate each other. It's an interesting business, and I have the illusion that I know more about it than anybody alive outside Goebbels, and I like it. Grierson did want to match Goebbels in terms of propaganda, but he want, more than that, he wanted to beat him. For Grierson, the propaganda of hate was poor propaganda. It appealed to the base instincts in people. What he was interested in were the higher values of democracy, of individualism, of freedom, and that was bound up with the propaganda of love, of an international outlook, that the propaganda of hate, he felt, just simply couldn't deliver. But even the propaganda of love was, well, propaganda. How far from the truth was it? Well, let's go back to how those Canadian newsreels covered the famous D-Day invasion. Our men, our war machines, are on the highways of Europe, breaking through to the final stronghold. It was heroic, but it was also ugly. Of the 14,000 Canadians who fought on D-Day, over 1,000 were killed or wounded. Almost a quarter million Allied casualties that summer. But their stories didn't fit in with the emerging legend of D-Day. It was inevitable that D-Day was to be made into an iconic moment, and one can understand that. But don't let us uh, mythologize, don't let us um, create a completely false uh, myth or an exaggerated myth uh, about it. Or about what happened after D-Day. As the Allies fought their way across France, there was a lot of what we call today collateral damage. 
civilian casualties. The Allies liberated the town of Qom, but it took a devastating bombardment to dislodge the Germans. Canadian cameramen were right in the town during the fighting. The Army film unit even made a movie about it. Relentlessly, war smashed its way through the city, leaving death, ruin, silence. But the actual number of civilian casualties, 2,000 killed and thousands more wounded, was never mentioned. You can't kill a city. Slowly, its pulse gained strength. Instead, the story was all about the rebuilding of the city. To shine a light, then, for propagandists on casualty figures, to highlight the cost of war at a time when you're trying to uh, win a campaign is obviously clearly a, a difficult subject. So films had to work within versions of the truth and notably by omission to omit any problematic facts. And Khan was just the beginning. In all, 20,000 French civilians were killed in the summer of 1944 by the retreating Nazis and the Allied bombings. The bitter cost of freedom. Those civilian victims weren't really able to express what they had lived through, quite simply because their experience contradicted fundamentally the glorious military account of the invasion. What they had lived through during the Normandy campaign was instead a very painful time, a moment of loss of many deaths. Goebbels and the Nazis eagerly exploited the plight of the French civilians, focusing only on the destruction. From the German point of view, they could then present the Allies as not only invading Nazi Europe, but also terrorizing the French population. And for propaganda people, that's, that's a, a godsend. The propaganda maestros on both sides of the war would spin the images for their own ends. But somebody had to keep filming those battle scenes, whatever the risk. For more than a month since D-Day, Jimmy Campbell and the other Canadian cameramen had been fighting their way through France, never putting their cameras down. On July 20th, 1944, Campbell was filming not far from Caen, a mortar hit and killed him instantly. But his camera was undamaged, and his pictures became part of the newsreels of history. By the war's end, 18 members of the Canadian Film and Photo Unit were wounded, and six were killed. Canadians are in the thick of it. A gun carrier is set afire. The man driving the Canadian film unit cameraman paid with his life for these pictures. But Campbell and his fellow camera commandos knew their sacrifice was worth it. Canada and its allies got a vital military victory and a much needed propaganda one. Finally, the promise of triumph over the forces of fascism. German soldiers relaxing at a holiday resort in the summer of 1944. What secrets were they hiding behind their smiles?
For these were not just ordinary soldiers, but the SS officers who ran Auschwitz, the most notorious of the Nazi death camps. Six million Jews across Europe would be systematically murdered by Hitler and his Third Reich. Today, the Holocaust is a well-known fact of World War II. Hard to believe that for most of the war, the Nazis were able to cover up what they were doing, using lies, censorship, and deception. Nazi propaganda was full of hate towards the Jews. But few people knew or cared what was actually happening to the hundreds of thousands they were rounding up. Despite the open hatred of the Jews that had been largely achieved by skillful propaganda throughout Germany, once they had been deported, the Nazi leadership were absolutely determined that the fate of Jews should no longer be discussed. And this was achieved by a combination of coercion and uh, strict censorship. The Nazis claimed they were just sending Jews to work camps. But why then were they rounding up old people? and children. Well, the Nazis came up with a story about this town, Theresienstadt, just 60 kilometers north of Prague. It became the stage for one of the most elaborate and cruel hoaxes of World War II. And the Germans almost got away with it. The Nazis claimed that Theresienstadt was a model ghetto for the Jews they sent there. The elderly, children, as well as famous artists, musicians, and intellectuals. The Nazis even made films here to try to sell their message. Theresienstadt as a, as a propaganda camp had a double function. On the one hand, it was needed by the Nazis to convince Germans inside Germany uh, that their Jewish citizens, the Jewish neighbors that they saw being deported, uh, were well off in a town somewhere in, in the East. But then they figured out that they might use Dresdenstadt also as a sort of a show camp, um, which they could use to persuade the rest of the world, the outside world, that they were treating the Jews well. But what was life really like behind the walls of Theresienstadt? The International Committee of the Red Cross kept pressing for a visit. After months of delay, the Nazis finally agreed. The Red Cross sent Maurice Rossell, a 27-year-old doctor from their Berlin office. On June 23, 1944, he showed up with two other delegates to inspect the camp under the watchful eyes of the Nazi tour guides. Every step of the Red Cross tour would be carefully choreographed. The SS drew up this detailed map, meticulously plotting what the visitors would see and what they wouldn't see. Nothing would be left to chance for the big show. The visitors were driven down clean, uncrowded streets, past smiling people who looked well off and well fed. They were escorted inside a few carefully selected living quarters. Just behind the market plats, the town square, the Red Cross officials were taken to a park filled with children. apparently happy at play. The Nazis even allowed the Red Cross to take these pictures. Gonda Redlich, a teacher before the war, was one of the youth leaders in the ghetto. Our enemies want us to be cheerful. They want to show that the Jewish city is happy. The Red Cross saw the wonderful children the only question is, did they really believe what they were shown?
Apparently, they did. Maurice Russell was full of praise in his official report to the Red Cross. Our amazement was extraordinary to find in the ghetto a city that was leading an almost normal existence. The Jewish city is truly astonishing. It was a complete victory from the Nazi point of view, and the Nazis could say, well, this is the best thing that could have happened to us. We never believed that they would fall for it, but they did completely. But what was the real story behind the Nazi facade? Those spacious living quarters? Up the stairs the Red Cross never climbed were filthy attics crammed with people. These drawings, made secretly by Jewish artists in the camp, showed the real face of life and death there. George Brady was 14 when he was sent to Theresienstadt with his younger sister, Hannah. There were 42 of us crammed into a single room. People were dying of typhus and polio. It was terrible. If the Red Cross would have been smart, they could have gone behind the facade to really look or talk to people without the SS being present but they didn't want to know. Behind the walls where the Red Cross never ventured were the gallows the Nazis used to hang prisoners. The Nazis made sure the Red Cross visitors never saw the hungry and the sick. Or this morgue on the edge of town, where more than a hundred bodies were piling up every day. Thirty-three thousand Jews would die in Theresienstadt just from hunger and disease alone. And those children? who smiled for the Red Cross cameras, everything they were given for the performance was taken from them. Their food, their playground, and soon, much more. The actors in the Nazi show were no longer needed. The children and the adults were told to pack up their belongings. They were to be shipped off as so many had been before them. Destination unknown. Most of the Jews from Theresienstadt were herded on to 11 transport trains that fall, including George Brady and his sister, Hannah. We were afraid of the transports. Going out east, Nobody really knew where. Gonda Redlick was also on board with his infant son. What is going to happen? We travel my son on a transport like thousands before us. Hopefully the time of our redemption is near. Those were the last words in his diary. The trains left Theresienstadt to a place few people at the time had ever heard of. A camp in Poland named Auschwitz. George Brady would remember it as the worst day of his life. We had no idea at first that it was an extermination camp or why there was a huge flame in the distance. It was just unspeakable horror. A few days before Brady arrived at Auschwitz, Maurice Rossell from the Red Cross 
also showed up at the camp. He came to check on the welfare of the Jewish prisoners. But this time, the Nazis would not let him be on the camp commander's office. For good reason. Because hidden behind the gates of Auschwitz, the Nazis had set up what history had never seen before. Killing factories designed to murder millions. Despite the cover-up, by the fall of 1944, a steady stream of reports and eyewitness accounts had exposed the truth about what was going on here. But the West largely ignored the fate of the Jews. By this time, it's quite clear that Jews were being exterminated, and yet there is still this considerable indifference on the part of Allied leaders. And one of the questions I think one would have to seriously ask is, was there a level of anti-Semitism? And I think that must be a factor. And what about inside Germany? Remember those SS officers from Auschwitz? Did they stay completely silent about the atrocities? Of course, soldiers told, and, and there were rumors going all, all over the place. People must have known something awful happened to these to these Jews, because respected Jewish family then being loaded on lorries like cattle. It was obvious that this uh, was going to be awful. One million Jews would be transported to Auschwitz to be killed. Over 40,000 from Theresienstadt alone. George Brady would be one of the few to survive his sister, Hannah, would not. Nor would most of the other children of Theresienstadt, who had served as props for the Nazi propaganda show. Almost all of them, 8,000, would perish in the Holocaust. Tokyo, 1945. A city worried and waiting. Japan's military rulers had long promised the people that their island empire would never be invaded. Even the slogan on a boy's kite hails the victories of Japan's army. But there had been few victories to celebrate lately. The war in the Pacific had been raging ever since Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941. By early 1945, the Americans had captured several strategic Japanese islands. First Saipan fell, then Iwo Jima. The Americans were within striking distance of Tokyo. So the Japanese drew inspiration from the Emperor Hirohito, revered as a god, and from the nation's heroes. Kamikaze pilots sent out to kill themselves by crashing their planes into enemy targets. Ordinary citizens felt compelled to adopt the same spirit of sacrifice and no surrender. It was very easy for the military to manipulate that devotion and loyalty. People were made to believe that they would be killed or tortured or raped by the Americans, and that it was preferable to die than uh, being in the hands of the Americans. Even children were recruited to the cause. In one popular cartoon, the hero Peach Boy leads a squadron of cute animals into battle. Peach Boy says, tomorrow we will be attacking the enemy and fighting until the last man. Are you ready? Yes, they answer. 12-year-old Kazuyo Funato found it all inspiring. 
I wanted to fight together with everyone. The Emperor was said to be a symbol of the Japanese people and a god. They told us we will never lose. An ocean away, the Americans were also being told that they could never lose. We're gonna have to slap the dirty little Jap. Uncle Sam, the guy who can do it. Twenty-year-old Natali Nickerson was as caught up in the war effort as everyone else. Dreaming of becoming a model, she worked in a bomber aircraft factory in Phoenix, Arizona. My brother was a fighter pilot. My boyfriend was a Navy lieutenant, and I was doing my part. We just wanted the war to end quickly. But the vicious war in the Pacific would not end quickly. Remember the march of death in the broiling sun. Newsreels were filled with reports of Japan's atrocities against Allied prisoners of war. 5,000 American soldiers murdered, others tortured and starved, and some buried alive. Racial hatred was inflamed as Uncle Sam got ready to finish the job with the Japanese. American propaganda in Europe was directed very much at the Nazi party as opposed to the German people as a whole. What we see in the Pacific War is a very different type of propaganda where the, the Americans targeted the whole of the population and not just the leadership. And so there was a very important ideological and racial dimension that had profound implications for the future of this conflict. American propaganda portrayed the Japanese as buck-toothed vermin that had to be squashed. And Hollywood pumped up the anti-Japanese fervor. This 1944 Warner Brothers movie starring Errol Flynn was typical. Stinking little savages. Wipe them out, I say. Wipe them out. Wipe them off the face of the earth. Wipe them off the face of the earth. That kind of language was all around back then. And as Life magazine put it, Americans had to learn to hate the Germans, but hating the Japs comes natural as natural as fighting Indians once was. And they went looking for stories and pictures to whip up that hatred. So in May of 1944, Life Magazine's Picture of the Week featured none other than Natalie Nickerson. With a story that fit the mood of the times, her sailor boyfriend had sent her a special present, a skull with these words written on it. This is a good Jap, a dead one, picked up on the New Guinea beach. They saw that picture of the skull in Japan as well. The Japanese propaganda machine was monitoring the American media and pounced, reproducing Natalie Nickerson's story as proof the Yankees were devil bastards. The skull photograph was something of a propaganda gold mine for the Japanese, because lo and behold, here is the proof. They don't only hate us when we're alive, they even hate us when we're dead. Maybe they're going to make your, your skull into a flower pot. That's how much they hate us, and that's why we would rather all of us, every last one of us, die. On the evening of March 9th, 1945, Tokyo police photographer Koyo Ishikawa gazed out over his city, filled with dread. I wondered from which direction the enemy would strike. The winds are moaning and blowing violently. I was horrified with the thought of the hell caused by the bombs. The drumbeat of propaganda loaded with hate had been pounding on both sides for years, and now ordinary civilians would pay the cost. Just after midnight, more than 300 B-29 American bombers approached Tokyo, packed with incendiary bombs. Especially designed to set ablaze a city made up largely of wooden buildings.
As the bombs fell, Ishikawa risked his life to record the inferno that was sweeping through his city. The streets were rivers of fire. The people themselves blazed like matchsticks. Kazuyo Funato, the 12-year-old so inspired by her emperor, lost five members of her family to the firestorm. We were trapped in a melting pot of fire. My brother Minoru was engulfed by the flames. He was burned alive. The raid lasted just over two hours, leaving more than 100,000 people dead. The next morning, they began collecting the bodies. And police photographer Koyo Ishikawa kept taking his haunting pictures. I hesitated to press the button because I thought that those who were killed might scold me saying, don't take a picture of me in such a shameful and miserable state. I bowed quietly before taking a picture and I left the scene after praying. He thought that even if he dies, the film inside his camera would survive and people will see them. He was thinking, no one but I can document this. The Americans flattened an area of Tokyo the same size as Manhattan. That's not a fact that could just be covered up. But for different reasons, neither the Japanese nor the Americans want the full story of what happened to get out. Japan's military rulers heavily censored the news coverage. They never even released any casualty figures. The police later asked Ishikawa to turn over his negatives, but he refused, fearing they would be destroyed. The government always told the people, we are always winning. They never wanted to show that they were losing. So publishing the news of the devastation was unthinkable. Instead, the emperor god Hirohito rarely seen in public, briefly toured the ruins. Once again, sending out the message of no surrender. We are still one because we still have our emperor. You can come, you can bomb us, you can try to wipe us out. It doesn't matter. Hurt us all you want to. We cannot be defeated. We are invincible. Tokyo bomb. Back in the States, the bombings were big news, hailed as just revenge for Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor three years earlier. To the warlords of Japan, we have not forgotten. The B-29s will remind you again and again and again. Newsreels showed distant images of a charred city. No mention of the dead. Remember Life magazine? It hailed the bombers that saturated the slums with flaming jelly gasoline. The man who documented what really happened buried his negatives in his garden. Koyo Ishikawa hoped that one day his evidence of the 100,000 people killed that night would come to light. I have to pass on these pictures to the next generation. A photograph is a witness to the world a witness of history. It would be years before a new generation in Japan would ever get to see Ishikawa's photographs. I think what we see uh, in, in the Second World War are huge attempts by governments of all sides to try and hide the everyday horrors of 20th century modern warfare. 
So whether we're talking about the casualties at D-Day, the fate of the Jews in the Holocaust, the firebombing in Tokyo, doesn't matter how long it takes, the attempts by governments to cover up the horrors of war will almost inevitably fail because the truth will always come out. <laughs>